uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Donato Kiniger. I'm the Vice President of the World Academy of Art and Science. And I'm very pleased to moderate or facilitate this discussion uh, that is extremely interesting because I feel that uh, here is Marcel as well. Hello, Marcel. You can hear me, I'm sure. Uh, I will introduce you one after the other one in a minute. This is the session probably where uh, the, uh, the, the, the best ideas will come out. I mean, you have, uh, I hope so, for sure. Uh, uh, you have given some thought to the issues. You have uh, written papers that have been presented for this uh, special conference on education for human security. Uh, so this I would assume, uh, and since uh, I read some excerpts of your, uh, of your papers, I, I may say so. Uh, I feel that you are coming up with uh, some original uh, insights, some uh, uh, very good ideas that we probably define also our future strategies. Uh, in terms of what should be done, what's next, uh, to uh, shape a different kind of education that in turn um, changes the cultural models that we are, that we are confronted with, uh, that we are fostering one way or another, but that are uh, inefficient, uh, this is my personal views at least, are presently inefficient in terms of shaping a, a more secure world for human beings. Uh, when we talk about human security, we talk about a perspective, the perspective on the individuals. Uh, we are not just uh, talking about state security, we're talking about uh, the rights of the individuals, uh, the, um, the needs and aspirations of individuals. So Cultural needs certainly are the basis for all advancements, for all social advancements. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, the first speaker uh, of this uh, special, as I said, special session on papers that have been submitted for this conference. The first speaker is Ulitsa Segerstrale. Uh, and Ulissa, hello, uh, professor of sociology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I went through uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the papers that, that uh, as I said, that have been presented, and I see that you talk about existential security. Uh, maybe you have been influenced by uh, Soren Kierkegaard one way or another, uh, or other sociologists that certainly have uh, shape your sense of self-awareness and, and what has to be done to uh, uh, change the information, the, sorry, the educational model. But let me just give the floor to you, present your paper and more substantially actually your viewpoint. What has to be done, Ulitsa? <laughs> the floor is yours and uh, you. you are the first speaker. Please, yeah. uh, this, the, this, the title of your paper is uh, is educational security, existential security, and the role of sociology. Yes, Over. thank you. Yes, <clears throat> uh, I want to concentrate uh, on, on three things related to educational security. Uh, the implicit ways in which formal education helps students in many informal ways. The role of sociology as a provider of systemic uh, uh, explanations of social behavior, uh, and the big picture in many respects. Uh, and uh, finally, the important category of existential security, which I kind of, it kind of occurred to me when I was working on this, that there is a, this has not been addressed strongly enough and I, I will not be able to do it in detail either, but I want to raise it as an issue. So first, uh, 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 the first topic, which is, uh, educational security in general. Uh, of course, there are many types of security for the student, uh, which are also informal, coming with the uh, formal uh, organization, particularly if it's a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, not a video system. Uh, it, uh, the school is going to be a place to be, a place to eat, 
a place to make friends. Place to eat was something that I don't think many people thought about before the COVID, but there we heard uh, many, many reports that because schools were closed, some students could not eat. And they had been counting with that all the day. So new kind of ways of providing food for these, for these uh, students who could not go to school were, were invented uh, at that point. Um, but school, uh, schools, of course, uh, uh, other informal uh, things are, of course, uh, uh, a place for developing uh, on oneself, one's personality, discovering one's strengths and weaknesses, and develop, developing defenses for handling life's surprises of various kinds. Um, here, sociology, if you go now to subject matter, sociology is a very rather special uh, uh, science uh, that I discovered myself because I was uh, first studying natural science, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, mathematics. And uh, uh, after graduating from that, I decided that I actually should study social science where I am now. And I am now an intermediary between the two kinds of sciences. Uh, uh, sociology is, is different from everyday life because it's uh, actually a systemic uh, science of society, uh, which uh, uh, and which by its very nature orients uh, students, uh, people to, to problem areas which overlap uh, with, with this conference's uh, identified security areas. Um, uh, I like to expose uh, my students. Uh, uh, I have general area student, students from many fields. I like to uh, expose them to sociological ways of thinking uh, and actually uh, uh, to see the world in a different way, because I went through that kind of transformation. It took me about one year to switch between reading formulas and very technical and kind of precise uh, descriptions of reality to, to, a more, to a different kind of world. And it, it was a, a good experience, but it took a little time for the brain to fix, to fix itself. Um, so what is sociology about? What is particularly exciting, I think, is that uh, sociology has concepts which um, uh, address reality, aspects of reality that people don't uh, usually see or think about. Uh, the idea of uh, manifest and latent functions. There are latent functions in everything we do, and they may actually be more important, uh, but we don't reflect on it. We just go through uh, 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 various uh, things in a kind of a, a regular way. There are unintended consequences of many good, seemingly good plans. And I especially like the so-called Thomas theorem, which says, if people define situations um, uh, as real, they are real in their consequences. This is extremely important. If you think about uh, 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 fact gathering, uh, 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 very competent uh, researchers, and investigators of various kinds, they just go and look and they gather facts, but they don't know what, if they don't gather what are in people's minds, they cannot foresee, shall we say, suicide bombers. Now I think that that was something that, that put opened up this, this total uh, new perspective for everybody. So we may not need Thomas theorem any longer. Um, uh, but sociology also involves um, uh, systemic thinking, kind of searching for a big picture, searching for causes and uh, uh, phenomena outside the individual. Um, and uh, uh, this is something called, uh, was, uh, uh, a famous sociologist uh, called C. Wright Mills uh, called this the sociological imagination. And the idea here is rather interesting because it liberates the individual from self-scrutiny and self-doubt and, uh, and feeling guilty all the time, which is that maybe your marriage did not fail because of particular personal problems, but maybe it was because the economic system at the time was impossible. You, it did not provide uh, 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 if enough money for you and for your children, shall we say, and, uh, uh, or the transportation system was not uh, uh, working. Uh, or there are lots and lots of reasons that create very big problems at the personal level, which are really not your fault. So you should not blame yourself necessarily. You can actually look outside to look at the bigger picture. Of course, then you may have some fault also, but it's not only your fault. 
this I, I felt was a very interesting insight. And anyway, it orients your, your, your thinking to a bigger problem that actually may exist and could be researched. Um, so uh, uh, another thing which is important, uh, having a school and having students go to school, is that uh, they get, can get involved with each other. And uh, this looks uh, obvious, but students don't necessarily get involved with each other. I think this, the teacher has to do something about this. Because um, as Stefan Brunhuber uh, 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 said a few years ago, and I was always impressed with this and still carry it with me, it takes only to have one friend in class for you not to leave that class, OK? You need that support. There is this kind of interesting uh, uh, threshold level of support that you, you, you need not to feel lost. And I can see students feeling kind of new in the class and lost. And uh, I think the best thing is to have some kind of small project, very innocent, uh, not too uh, personal either because they may be too much, but some kind of little discussion project to sit in small groups and discuss that and after that, they can say hello to each other because they not, now they formally know each other and so on and so on. And you, you go on and, and do a little of this all the time so that they, they bond with each other a little and feel a little like a, a group. It's a, it doesn't have to, one doesn't have to do a lot of this, but enough for students to enjoy being in a class with other students. And, and then uh, for exams, I have suggested they do exam preparation groups uh, also. And in this way, they will work together on projects of various kinds. I like invite you to conclude and say maybe something about, uh, because you are talking a lot about school, you know, the school and okay. the president's school. And, you know, since, uh, since, you know, uh, since 2000, I think that uh, the number of students studying remotely in the world has multiplied 900, 900 times. So what effect does this have on the school? Uh, this is what I would like to hear, uh, if it's part of your analysis. Uh, uh, you're talking about the school is obviously a, a, a place, a safe place, as you are describing it, you know, where uh, students can regroup and can find also their own identity. But uh, is the school still the same school of uh, the year 2000 oh, no, or no. now no. projected into a different, uh, in different no. kind of... Uh, um, field and, 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 and reality. <clears throat> uh, yes, I, uh, I cannot really answer that question because I have not investigated it, but I know that even these MOOCs and all this kind of arrangement always uh, uh, emphasize that there should be groups that meet uh, in person. They cannot, it should not only be online. So there are, are some kind of ways, but let me get to existential insecurity very quickly. So uh, uh, not insecure, yeah. What is existential security? And uh, uh, that would, uh, for me, include the idea of security from metaphysical type of fear and uncertainty about the world and the future. And I think we all uh, have some of that, but uh, we should not uh, uh, live in, in a state of fear and anxiety. And uh, 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 I think there are many defenses that educators can, can uh, provide for students. For instance, uh, uh, learning about uh, things that can easily go wrong in social life, uh, uh, all this that is part of social psychology, group pressures uh, uh, and various kinds of manipulations and uh, uh, our own cognitive biases that mislead us and so on. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and I think that the, uh, the social sciences have great tools for overcoming existential insecurity when it comes to uh, understanding uh, the world and kind of coping. But here's my last point. At the same time, we should not forget that the natural science is actually the kind of cosmic specialist in the, uh, uh, in the existential security aspect. We have human, sorry, humankind has come a long way because of science. And this is why science should be defended against various types of attacks and misrepresentations which serve to undermine trust and spawn chaos. And there have been many Would such attacks. Yes, thank you. I think this is a perfect line to close yeah. your excellent yeah. and, and, and uh, very uh, exciting, I would say, presentation. I'm sure that uh, participants will have the opportunity to read in full your paper. 
uh, and comment on that. Uh, so thank you very much. Let me remind all that we have really five, six minutes each if we want to conclude uh -huh. in less than one hour. Uh, and uh, I want also to acknowledge the presence of Jerome Glenn. Uh, Jerome, are you still with us? I hope you are not presenting a paper, but you will come in uh, at the end, if that's all right with you, uh, to sum up a bit the, the, uh, the discussion and also uh, to comment on uh, these various uh, uh, trends and, and evolutionary trends that uh, our colleagues are presenting and your own opinions, of course. Uh, so the next one to speak is uh, our um, fellow and, uh, and um, board member Marcel, Marcel van der Woerde. Uh, Marcel, good afternoon to you. Uh, and you are professor at Delft University of Technology uh, in the Netherlands. And your paper is about uh, the needs and programs to understand advanced technology and threats to human security. So the question for you is very straightforward. What are those threats? I mean, uh, uh, there is uh, 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 a lot of uh, propaganda around this issue. There is a lot of uh, misrepresentation, I would like to say, about this issue. Uh, but you are certainly the right man in the right spot to tell us uh, what is what do we have to fear uh, from technology and how technology can instead help us to have a better life and be more secure. Marcel, to you, thank you. Do you understand me, Chairman? Is okay? We hear you very well, yes. Um, like you said, I'm talking about advanced technologies in relation and the threats to human security. Now, human security as a definition says free, free freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom from indignity. Human security addresses all kinds of areas from peace to human rights, inequality, jobs, etc., etc. Technology plays an important role in this all. There are two, or I define technology into two parts that are the conventional technologies, that are the technologies of the last hundred years. Uh, they could have been improved more and more but they still are considered as the conventional technologies, traditional technologies, like also in the conference one was talking and also the VAS is doing a lot in the Las, Las Vegas, a big industrial kind of meeting. That is conventional, traditional technologies in microelectronics. The point here is that advanced technologies are the technologies of the next 25, 50 years to come. These technologies are different from the conventional ones in the following. In the conventional technologies, if you take the example again from Las Vegas in the microelectronics, you have a borderline between borderline. You have a red wire who says what is okay and what is a danger. What is fine and what is bad? That we have it in all. You can take that in food. In food, each country has an institute who controls the food and say, well, this is bad, that is good. You have it also on the road, it is a red light. There is a border and you know where to go and where not to go. And generally, that are fixed by the governments, this border. They fix it in collaboration with all the partners involved. Now, the point of the advanced technologies, like the field of the quantum mechanics, physics, quantum theory, etc., that is a theory which not many students can study at university level. And are very talented students are needed for that one. But you have also the artificial intelligence, you have the robotics, you have the nanotechnologies and so on. I can enumerate a number of those. If I take on the nanotechnology and the advanced technologies, but an example on the nanotechnology, the nano chocolate. The industry prepares nano chocolate. We are much better than other chocolates. 
Now, at the European Union in Brussels, on a table on the right hand side are the industrialists who want to produce it, and on the left hand side are the governments and medical doctors, etc. And the medical doctors and the government, they say to the industry, you have to put the word nano on your packaging materials. And the industry said, ah, no, no, no. If I put nano on it, it will not be sold anymore. And it, uh, it had, the economy is too important. So we cannot get an agreement. We can in the nanotechnology not define a red wire. We don't know what is bad and what is good. But the people who are eat the nano chocolate and get it in their body, if they become ill for one or another reason or a strange illness, they may say, ah, it is due to the nano. But nobody in the world, no medical doctor in the world can check the nano in the body of any people. So there is no mean to control it. And that is in all the kind of the advanced technologies. You don't have a red wire. You don't know where it is good, where it is bad. We don't know that. It's far away one from each other. And in the advanced technologies, we have one of the great problems. In the past, we still had the nuclear technology in the past, which was not so much the advanced, but we had that and we were able in that nuclear to find the red wire. It is so that the red wire is defined by a number of nuclear physicists who say, you should not use that for bombs. You can use it for medical applications. You can use it for all others, but not for there. There was a red wire. Now in all over areas of the advanced technologies, there is no wire. We don't know what is good and what is bad. And uh, here, one of the great problems what we have in the advanced technologies is that compared to the nuclear, in the nuclear, it is under the control of some government in the kind of the advanced technologies of the future, like the nanotechnologies, the so-called uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we don't have one government. There's no government who can define it. It are only the advanced scientists, the advanced nuclear or chemical or other kind of scientists who can define it. And the, um, the point is, in compared to the nuclear, we need a nuclear that is a bomb. Here, it can be produced. And in the nuclear part, it is only a few countries who can produce it. In the kind of the nuclear, in the kind of the so-called uh, um, artificial intelligence, everybody can practically do it in the future. So everybody can put the world in a kind of a falsified world. We could get a completely different world by the artificial intelligence. So we can change the world completely, that the people are thinking in a different way. I will give you an example. Today, it starts at the universities, and there are students, the doctor students, doctorates, they produce their doctor thesis, and the professor says, that is a fantastic study, but it is a false study. Now they start more and more to, to learn and at universities to check these doctoral students to see is that a falsified, is that an artificial intelligence made kind of study. <laughs> so we get already these kind of problems. And uh, um, now we don't know how to treat all these kind of things. And it are only the advanced people. And then we come on the point that we are just a sociologist. We are philosophers and so on. Today, these people, they don't understand anything, anything of the advanced technologies. So they cannot put borderlines and they cannot talk together to the advanced scientists because they speak a completely different language. So here we have a great problem about fixing where is the limit of good and bad in the advanced technologies. And here, one had to do a lot. Now, in respect to studies, which studies at the university, what kind of programs? It can only be done by excellent, talented students at the university on their doctorate level, on the highest level. 
that they, uh, they can define or try to define or to learn in the future. But they are looking to their own scientific interest and they miss the human body. They miss the human element. They miss really the philosopher. They miss all these people. Now, what has to be done in future that is not only transdisciplinarity and what one is talking, that is very easy. But here, one had the people who were 100 and 100 years back where we had a philosopher who was a mathematician. We had again, during the many years and last 100 years particularly, the human sciences went in one direction and the advanced sciences, chemistry, physics, engineering, medicine, went in a completely different area. And to bring them to set together again would be one of the targets, which will be very difficult as we are far away from each other. No one could say, some people say, oh, the advanced, advanced technologies, we don't need them anymore. Many people say that we cannot follow the actual sciences. The advanced sciences is completely out of our scope. People cannot think on that. And it would be very difficult to transfer it in a language so that the people can really understand it. But the advanced sciences we need, for example, in order to solve the cancer problem, in order the Alzheimer problem, and all, we need the advanced sciences. And uh, the same thing in the nanotechnologies. So in general, I would like to say, I prepared a kind of a study in which I indicate what is the advanced technologies. I also tried to indicate what kind of studies which are needed in the advanced sciences. But in the advanced, advanced technologies, the human elements are completely neglected for the time being. Nobody, the scientists, they don't think on that one. It has no value, the human part. They go for sciences, sciences, and sciences, and this is very dangerous for the next 25 or 50 years. We need them, but we don't know where is the danger, and the danger could be very quick because these sciences develop very, very, very quickly. We have waited 100 years to develop the microtechnology, but we will only need 10, 20, 25 years in order to develop the advanced technology in applications which are absolutely not known today. And it would be a very dangerous element. And we have now the problem about the environment uh, where we fix one degree and two degrees, etc. We have already uh, a disorder of the world in the case of the so called artificial intelligence. They may change the human completely, and we will have other kinds of technologies like the quantum technology, the nanotechnology, who will give a completely different type of world. And this could be danger. And the earth will not only by the environment, but will be the humans living in the world, they will get a completely other vision, and this could be dangerous. And we cannot find the limit where to stop, how to stop, and find ways to stop the system. I would like to stop, Chairman, in order to tell you that the advanced technologies are the most important topic in the element. But I think that you have made your points very well. Uh, thank you for delineating your views so clearly and also spotting uh, these many uh, challenges, many actually dangers that are actually around the corner and that we don't see them coming. So this is probably the real risk for humanity, uh, the fact that they cannot be anticipated uh, as they're not even fully understood. Uh, only uh, specialists can uh, really predict uh, what could happen, uh, but even in that case, it's hard to have an uh, accurate prediction and, uh, and have uh, uh, strategies to counteract these, these kind of challenges and, and uh, and in particular dangers for human societies, for human security. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, and please stay with us, all of you who just spoke, because we will have time probably for, for some questions from, uh, from the public, from those who are following us, other participants. And uh, uh, certainly, Jerome, as we said, will come in at the end uh, to uh, wrap it up and, and see also what are the outstanding issues uh, among the various uh, various subjects that you are fleshing out right now. The next one to speak is Professor David Harris from Canada. 
David Harris is the chair of the Canadian Pagwash Group and is Principal Security and Sustainable uh, Sustainability Guide. Uh, this I frankly don't understand what that means, in part of, as, as your title, probably something very, very useful. Uh, we would like to have a guide for sustainability, uh, all of us, so you can explain that. Now, uh, out of the abstract uh, that you have, uh, of the paper that you have submitted, the title is Education Must Be Restructured as Learning. So you are focusing on love of learning, the lifelong journey that every human being uh, should be uh, capacitated to uh, develop, I mean, to, to obtain, actually, as a gift for himself and for society. So maybe you can explain to us uh, how do you see this life learning, um, lifelong learning process uh, and how that can be really transformative uh, for societies and uh, for human security. David, thank you. And I, I, I'd like to make the point that I, I have a number of papers uh, in large part because I've been involved in human security as a military officer, a national developer, an educator, uh, and a business person for now 55 years. Uh, the first time I became really, really interested in human security when I became uh, a, a non-volunteer person in the Turkish engagement of Cyprus in 1974, uh, which nobody was prepared for and we didn't handle very well. So human security is something I've been thinking about all my life. The instructions from the organizers was to come up with some actions for making a difference. So very briefly, I came up with seven actions mm -hmm. and I'm more than willing to carry on a discussion afterwards Action one, education should have the status of a human right. Now, how we define it, of course, is cultural, ethical, national, historical, and so on. But I recall, and I did a major study on this, John Ruggie in 2008 published his report on business and human rights, protect, respect, and remedy. Yes. Protect, respect, and remedy. Sounds pretty human security to me. And I note these days, right now, as we participate in this panel, a major human rights conference is underway at the UN. It's five weeks long. It nowhere mentions education in its documentation. I think that's a shame. I think that needs to be certainly the next conference it needs to be adjusted. My second action, the education business transitions from for-profit to for-society. Again, using John Ruggie's report and reading everything we have these days about how millions and millions and millions of people who would like to learn cannot because either they can't afford it or because the system will not allow them to recover from the expense after they do their learning. From for-profit to for society. Number three, education has made a lifelong journey of learning. The way we have it now, it's in boxes, grade school, high school, university, postgraduate university, postdoctorate. It's in packages, one after the other. And there are very few feedback loops, even with all the changes in context that are happening at an accelerating rate. And it's important, you learn much better with others who allow you to choose to color to adjust what you are learning. So the teacher in effect these days needs to become in some ways one of the students and learn from their students. And just the fact of life, there are no experts on the future because that's impossible. 
So everybody who's preparing this in this lifelong journey is as eligible to take part as everybody else. It's inclusive. It's democratic. Four, all curricula should include courses in foresight so that learners better know what they need to learn for the future. The future in which they will be the leaders, in which they will still be alive. Unlike uh, me at my age, 20 years from now, I probably won't be here. But the people that are in learning right now will be and will be needing what they have imagined, anticipated beforehand. And just recently, the World Futures Studies Federation uh, put up its what is a continuously updated open source list of foresight courses. And some of them, because I know the people involved, are very, very good. And they are very engaging for the young, for the old, and for the expert. Five, apprenticeship. The policies for education in all countries should acknowledge the value of apprenticeship. In some places, we call this uh, on-job training, on-job learning, uh, the, the validation, uh, sandwich courses, and so on. But apprenticeship, back in England, I, I study old silver and the guilds were places where a person was taken under the wing of a master uh, silversmith and trained and learned with him or her and then became in their own right accredited and then became a master in their own right. And the apprenticeship confirmed learning, refined skills that they'd already had, built, build self-confidence. I know this myself and enhances one reputa one's reputation for good work. Academic tenure, and I know this is controversial, but it's a luxury forever unique to academe. Um, I suppose one can interpret being a person in a religious order as having forever tenure, but academic tenure needs to be no longer automatically permanent, but regularly re-earned. I mean, we just heard from Marcel about advanced technology and, and the fact that it, it, it could change the world. Well, the people that learned 40 years ago, me, my nuclear engineering degrees, quite frankly, I would be a danger if I was allowed loose in a nuclear reactor today <laughs> because I am not aware of all the things that have happened in those 40 years to change the context for whether it's nuclear energy or a nuclear weapon or a nuclear system. Academic tenure must be adjusted. And my seventh request, and it is a request, is to engage the elderly. Here in Canada, we're in the midst of a major, major discussion uh, provoked by um, oh, provoked by how poorly we treated our indigenous people for decades and decades and decades and truth and reconciliation commissions and national boards of inquiry and so on. And the indigenous people are teaching us more and more that the elderly should not be retired in the sense of just being allowed to rest on the sidelines of what is happening in our education and in our teaching. But they are outstanding mentors, coaches, and therapists, and listeners. The elderly listen well. Let me finish with my relativity slide. Uh, if some or the, all yeah. of those yeah. actions are taken, mm -hmm. we'll have more qualified essential workers Remember when the COVID-19 first broke out and suddenly nothing really worked because we didn't have enough personal care workers, nurses, doctors in the right places with the right qualifications, uh, with the right infrastructure. We'll have more satisfied learners at all ages. Hopefully that won't be so far in debt for so many years. 
and will make better use of education facilities, i.e. we will have better human security. And if we don't take any action, I refer to a Mark Andreessen statement just last week and the references there on the slide. We're heading into a world where a flat screen TV that covers your entire wall costs $100 and a four-year college degree costs $1 million. That is bad. That must not happen. Mr. Chairman, that is my message. Thank you. Very, very pragmatic, David. Very clear. I really appreciate your uh, synthetic uh, thoughts and um, very pugnant, very, very precise, uh, pointing towards uh, specific needs and, uh, and also an examination really of what, uh, what is the state of play. I mean, the, uh, the risk that if we do not change the situation, if we do not reappropriate ourselves, even of uh, uh, old traditions, because when you talk about apprenticeship, apprenticeship always exists. I mean, in uh, in Renaissance, you know, Renaissance could have not ever taken place if it was no no apprenticeship. I mean, uh, you would not have Leonardo da Vinci, you would not have uh, any other uh, genius or or prophet of of Renaissance if you didn't have apprenticeship. That is just one of the uh, seven uh, pillars of wisdom that you have uh, enunciated this afternoon. Uh, so I think that definitely we should subscribe to your theoretical approach. Frankly, I endorse it because I think they're all very good, very good point, well, well framed. Uh, now let's go to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Jalel Ezid. Jalel, good afternoon. Is a professor at the University of Tunis El Manar, and he has written a very interesting paper. Again, uh, I don't have the full paper with me, but I went through the, uh, the, 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 the um, what was provided to me. I mean, the, the abstract that was provided. And you say in this abstract that the risk here is increasing privatization and commercialization of education. I would like you to to elaborate on this point, if you don't mind, because this is certainly a, a, a very interesting perspective. And also you talk about the importance of building coalitions of educators, community activists, and policymakers to advocate for and implement alternative, an alternative method of education, a new, a new and better method of education. Um, so the, and these and many other interesting considerations spelled out in your paper. Maybe you would like to start from the point I have pointed out or just present your paper the way that is more suitable. Jalal, to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I would like uh, and uh, participating in this uh, a very very important uh, uh, conference. It's loading. While it's loading, I would like to say that uh, uh, I wish this uh, conference was uh, half a century ago, uh, because, uh, as you all know, in '72, limits to growth, a very important paper, uh, I mean book, uh, that was uh, a report uh, to the Club of Rome, uh, where it was very very clearly stated uh, that. Uh, uh, humanity is really uh, facing uh, a, a global collapse if we don't uh, straighten up uh, our uh, uh, house. Uh, but today, uh, we know that uh, uh, business as usual scenario uh, is almost confirmed. And I'm afraid today uh, that uh, uh, the human security issue, we went beyond the human security issue and we are really looking into uh, existential threat. And uh, uh, it could be that by the end uh, of the century, uh, it would be very, very difficult to uh, save humanity from itself because uh, we all know of the Anthropocene and uh, whatever is going on today in our societies and planet is due uh, to our activities or uh, more precisely to the activity uh, of uh, uh, 
a very, very uh, small number uh, of people. So people, I mean, already uh, some of the presenters talked about uh, what human security is. Uh, and I say, you know, free from fear, free from want and uh, free from indignity. That's extremely important. And that requires a comprehensive approach uh, and uh, working towards the well-being of all should be really uh, the North Star for humanity today. And we should do it as soon as possible. If not, we're going to be really, really uh, facing this existential uh, uh, possibilities. Well, we all know of the major existential threats. I just listed three here, climate change, nuclear weapons, as uh, uh, some of the pre presenters talked about, and global pandemics, as we lived it not long ago and still going, uh, uh, you know, with all its uh, social unrest, economic disruptions, and what have you. Uh, and then we would like to, you know, we would like to ask the question, why are we in the situation? Okay. The point is when we talk about education, especially, even though this is true for all other sectors, we end up really trying to tweak the education system from inside. We have the MOOCs, uh, we have uh, different pedagogical uh, uh, approaches, uh, we have different uh, 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 curricula and what have you. This is, I call it, tweaking of the education system. I'm not saying it's not useful. No, it's really important and useful. However, I believe that what is really constraining us from really uh, 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 providing the needed education system for us, humanity, in order to stop, you know, uh, uh, the threat uh, to everyone and each of us and try to embark in, on a new trajectory that will be sustainable and uh, uh, will seek well-being for everybody, including nature and life on earth in general. So neoliberalism has been the uh, superstructure, you know, that somehow engulfing every activity of uh, uh, human activity and consequently generated a culture okay that made for instance uh, you know uh, standardized testing as a common sense uh, in our education system competition as being the rule of the game commodification of education also uh, by privatizing uh, education uh, became also uh, uh, the canonical uh, way of uh, administering education to, unfortunately, you know, to a one tire of society, leaving the other tire on the side uh, with much less, uh, uh, how do I say it, uh, uh, of quality education. So this <coughs> neoliberal education system is the one that created whatever we are undergoing today. As a matter of fact, Passy uh, Schalberg, who's a, a, a university professor, called this program the Global Education Reform Movement, okay, which is actually the movement uh, that has been initiated since the 70s or 80s uh, by the new liberals. So the idea is how to really try to somehow uh, uh, change the situation so that education becomes a lever to saving humanity rather than, uh, you know, the sink uh, that will drain humanity towards uh, its uh, demise. Here, I would like to uh, uh, call for Antonio Gramsci cultural hegemony theory, and I believe Gramsci uh, gave us uh, a good tool to actually think this situation, to theorize them, understand them, and consequently be able to find remedies and to really uh, uh, fight these uh, situations. And some of you and the president of the session spoke of culture. Indeed, it is a matter of culture. Today, you know, uh, new liberalism's rules uh, became so natural uh, uh, that it is really the global nature and nobody is questioning it. And if today humanity is facing, uh, you know, its existential threats, I believe it's because this germ uh, education system has failed uh, humanity. So how to counter 
uh, 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 this, uh, this germ. So the idea here, I'm giving uh, three ideas, and there are so many others. Uh, these ideas are already there. The Education International Association has launched actually a, a, a global uh, a, a program to uh, counter the, the negative uh, effects of germ. The, the Teacher for Social Justice is also another organization giving conferences, workshops, and events that tries to teach teachers and all members of society to resist this germ policy that is really uh, producing all the ills uh, uh, we are living today. Community schools is also another way of teaching where we bring communities much closer to the learning experience uh, of the child or even uh, uh, the elders so that we can uh, uh, take care uh, of, uh, of, of the students, uh, of the learners, and try to really give them the best means uh, uh, to maximize their well-being, either individually and most also importantly, collectively. So that's really my message that I wanted to really uh, uh, share with you. Uh, today, we have a superstructure that somehow uh, changed uh, our way uh, of uh, uh, seeing society. And as a matter of fact, as Thatcher said, there is no society. That, that superstructure wants to tell us that there is no society. There is no community. There are only individuals. And when we are individualist, you know what happens. Whatever is going on today on planet Earth. And I hope we can change uh, uh, this direction and be able uh, to save humanity from itself. Thank you very much. Myself. I was saying we have some more time as uh, Giannani, our administrator, lets me know. Uh, so uh, we can go back to the speakers and add some other additional points if we wish. But uh, after uh, this very interesting presentation from Jalel, I would like to pass to uh, the, the floor to Jerome. Jerome, as you know, is the uh, president of the Millennium Project. Uh, and uh, Jerome, you have the uh, luxury of, of uh, looking towards the future. I mean, because uh, the millennium you're looking into is the present millennium, uh, and uh, we are just at the beginning of that. Uh, so I'm sure you have uh, the right foresight, uh, as someone said, to analyze and pinpoint what, what is happening right now and what is missing. I mean, uh, some of the considerations from the speakers that uh, just spoke, like uh, like Marcel, like Ulika, uh, Jalel, and David, who uh, was uh, very uh, precise and uh, organized, I would like to say, uh, so that he made our uh, task easier, in a sense, because he has his own protocol uh, that uh, we could approve or not approve, or in any case, support. Uh, in, a, in a way to, to see how we can improve education. I want to, before giving you the floor, Jerome, I, since we have a minute, I just want to add another point. Uh, a point that comes to my mind because at the opening session, one of our colleagues, um, uh, Oliva, I think her name is, yes, uh, said, you know, um, education uh, as therapy, or she used a, a language similar to that, lifeline. She said lifeline. And I like that very much because uh, I think that uh, the uh, education has uh, a lot to offer uh, for uh, the present and, and, and future generations. Uh, as, as far as education is the conduit, is uh, uh, let's say the, the engine for uh, cultural advancement. Now, the relation between and culture. Uh, I don't think that we have explored that that much, but I think it's necessary. It's necessary, especially if we talk about human security. How can we talk about human security if we, if we don't talk about genuine culture? I mean, a culture that appeals to minds and souls simultaneously, if possible, or certainly that follows both prongs, both tracks a culture that is able to transform habits, is able to 
uh, uh, represent feelings of humanity and of individuals. So I would like also a reflection around this particular thing. I mean, how can we make sure that uh, uh, there is a real advancement of, of culture, not just of education, that is, as I said, is the conduit to uh, what needs to be needs to be done is through uh, is through culture that you can have that sense of consciousness that sense of transformative consciousness that can really make you feel more secure you as individual or as people so jerome this is my simple take out of this uh, discourse i see also grant is joining us hello grant others are joining uh, so it's a sort of open session, Piero and, and Giannani. I don't know how you want to conduct the business, but now the floor is yours, Jerome. Well, Thank in you. response to your comment about what might not have been said in, or what's missing, several things. One is that we all know that the world is in a zero-sum power system. Uh, national studies of their posture, their futures looks at how they increase their power or maintain their power or what is the threat to their power. As long as we have a zero sum power game, we will have a prescription for unending conflict. And the tools of conflict are getting worse and dangerous and more decentralized and personalized. So it's a very nasty projection. One possibility is to take a, a page out of Bucky Fuller, future Bucky Fuller about synergy. When I say synergy, I mean a wheel in a box makes, a, makes nothing, but a wheel under a box makes a wheelbarrow. So it's the relationship, not simply cooperation, but relationship of the parts that make the synergy. We're doing an experiment in South Asia where we take nine countries, list them on one column, and then nine countries across the top, and say, how does Pakistan create a synergetic relationship with India? How does Pakistan create a synergetic relationship with Sri Lanka and so forth. So each of these countries are taking a look at trying to figure out what would be a world of synergetic analysis rather than just zero sum power analysis. So our schools of international affairs and diplomacy have to think about teaching alternative models of the world because a zero sum model is doomed. So we have to think of different models. Well, one is synergies, that's, that's, that's one thing. We're also doing experiment, by the way, with some um, uh, international foresight initiatives. The UN's got a new initiative, Secretary General's work. Uh, uh, Finland has got the uh, Committee for the Futures Initiatives with other, other legislatures. Uh, Dubai's got, got a futures initiative. Uh, OECD's got an initiative as well. So we're trying to look at the synergies among those four as well. So we're trying to try more, more experiments where people actually try to figure out if we can move, is it possible to move to a world of synergetic relationships rather than just zero sum? So that's something that for the schools of uh, diplomacy to include alternative worldview. Secondly, schools of business can do the same thing. Right now, schools of business teach competitive intelligence, competitive analysis, competitive advantage, competitive strategy. Okay, why not synergetic intelligence, synergetic advantage? We don't think about that. I've talked to several schools of business on this. They all say that's a great idea, but they haven't done it yet. I'm going to be talking to another one next week, School of Business, and we'll see if they can start to get that. So schools of business can also contribute to this thing. So that's one category. A second category uh, that's missing so far is what is the most immediate strategic threat to humanity? In my view, it is not climate change. I wrote about global warming in 1973, so I don't need someone to tell me that you know that's important. I know. But we don't get wiped out until the, the poison gas comes out of a dead ocean of oxygen back in uh, up into 21, 25 or so, because we can survive with some ocean going up, we can survive with some temperature, but wiping us out is further down the road. Artificial general intelligence, if we don't get the initial, today we have narrow intelligence, three kinds of intelligence, narrow, general, super. Narrow is what we have today. General, we could have in 10 years or so. If we don't get the initial conditions right for general intelligence, then how super intelligence evolves from general will be beyond our control and maybe beyond our liking. That's possible within the lifetime of all of us here. So the most immediate strategic threat 
is competition among the nations and corporations on getting artificial general intelligence wrong in the issue of conditions. And that's, in my view, the current arms race right now, not simply nuclear weapons, but it's the race to artificial general intelligence and quantum computing. Those two will be a synergy relationship. That impact on humanity will be earlier threat to human existence than will be climate change. But we're not looking at that. We constantly think about narrow intelligence. People say, oh my God, general intelligence is here with chat GBT. No, that's still narrow. General intelligence, the relationship between general intelligence and narrow is like the relationship between a fax machine and the internet. They're both part of the information economy. The difference between a fax machine and a internet is gigantic. And the last thing I'll just say, say very quickly on higher education, we should draw on the best of the world. Why do we have to take our courses in one university? We should, be have a, we should be able to hire or take into account all sources of the entire world and then package it together. The university can still make sure you're, you're getting a balanced education and evaluation and so forth. So higher education should be global access education as well. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you very much for adding your voice to this debate and, and bringing some novelties and new considerations, very powerful. And your concluding words, I find very well fitting. I mean, the open uh, education system that we want to create should have should grant access to all and not be uh, excluding people but rather being a, a, a choice for for all of us to to improve our knowledge and to improve our culture as we were saying before so i pass this uh, the the uh, the, the yes. baton to you as i said but first let's have a couple of uh, words from marcel and who yes. have Ulrika maybe also wants to say something more Chairman, on everything that has been said during the meeting, during the three days, and also especially today, the first point what I would like to make, how to realize that I am sitting in the rector's meeting at European universities, and also together with the academies in the United States. And the point is, the point is here very clearly, that uh, yeah. how to realize that, how to how to do that as all the rectors and all the students, they are really going in the line of advanced technologies in all areas to get the Nobel Prize at the end, to do a lot of research and you cannot stop them. And they neglect the topic about ethics. They don't consider that as important. And it would be very, very, very difficult to get one hour of ethics or of human, uh, human sciences in the high school or at the universities, because there are many other topics who get much higher priority. So who is bringing that change? Who is making the change? That is my first point. I have, by preparing my document, I have tried to discuss it with a number of universities, the best in the world. We had a meeting here at the Davos meeting with all the rectors of the best universities in the world. And they would like to get another kind of a program, which is not so much humanity, which I personally think as a scientist, I was also looking at sciences, but no humanity is important. So I don't know how we can realize that, the second point what I would like to make that is what also uh, uh, Jerome Glenn was really saying. I personally, I'm very much afraid about how the world is going. That will be a mess. No president will be able to, or, or from America or that, will be able to do it. It will be, the society will be changed in such a way. We have one example that is not the environment, but the environment is only a small topic. There are many, many other topics in which I see that the society, the human people will automatically be changed. And there will be not a lot of mechanisms like the, in, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence that is a power that nobody can control. Nobody can do it. You can do it from your computer. There are so many mechanisms to do it. In the nuclear field, there is only one or two who can stop the bomb. But in general, we have no possibility. 
And I think that it would be very useful to discuss not on what is missing and what should be done. How are we going to do that? Who are the actors which we can influence in the world to change that? the system at the, at the, the uh, university and high school system. And for the time being, we are going in the wrong, wrong direction. And in order to get it a little bit right, it is vitally important that the human scientists, sociologists, that the philosopher and so on are closely linked and take part in the advanced research. But for the time being, it is impossible. If I talk to philosophers about my advanced technologies, these people, you cannot talk to them. They don't understand anything on that field. It's a completely different language. And to put them again together would be very difficult. But I think it would be essential for the future of the humanity and all other things what you are doing and changes to make, which have been mentioned also today, that will not help. You must find a way in order to get people who really, or societies, rectors meetings at universities, you have to do people in industry, society, a number of, in order that things will be changed, that is a change. And I don't really see that, how that will be changed. Because- Marcel, you, you, you made your point that. very clearly. Thank you very much for pinpointing to the various subjects you you have uh, you have presented also the ethical elements the need for uh, a, a radical transformation and uh, and a further reflection on how to do it in order to conclude this session i would like to hear from jelel and then jerome uh, jelel please uh, jerry uh, i hear you uh, and i hear your message uh, and nice seeing you in this conference and as you know, I was in the group of the linear project who were discussing this uh, artificial general intelligence. Of course, I'm uh, fully with you. Uh, and uh, if something is going to happen, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to maybe happen by mistake and, by, and not that much by design. Okay, because I feel like uh, we are still very, very far from uh, uh, fully mastering this tool. However, you know, uh, we can identify, you know, many, many other threats coming from other technologies. What I'm afraid of, Jerry, is that, you know, we, we might concentrate our attention on one maybe technology or, or one issue and leave others aside, you see, and even if we get to solve the first issue we concentrated on, we're going to be beaten by the rest, you see. So it has to be a holistic approach to our security and to our existential threats. It's not a matter of saying one or the other. As a matter of fact, technologies are threatening us because of the superstructure, which is this uh, neoliberal hegemon, because these technologies are not being built to help society. They are built to make money. You see, it's all you know a matter of running after financial gains. If we can tweak that, and if we start really developing technology for the benefits of humanity and its well-being, as well as nature, things might change completely. So rather than really concentrating on one or the other technology, I believe we have to concentrate on, on our culture, this global culture, our humanity, and how we should be running our lives and the lives of the future generations so that we can give them <coughs> really a, 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 a dignifying life for centuries to come. So uh, I believe, uh, and, and, and this hinges on our values and in our ethics. I believe today our ethics are taking us, you know, uh, towards our end and not the other way around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jalel, for reminding us, as, as I was trying to introduce actually the subject of culture of the soul, I mean, the importance of culture in the end as the real transformative element of society. Jerome, up to you to conclude. Uh, and then we we have, I can see that Chris Wilmot and others wants to take the floor, but it will be under the edges of Janani, a excellent ad administratorship. Uh, so uh, please, Jerome. <clears throat> Yes, I agree, Jill. Oh, there's a lot to be worked on. As you know, Millennium Project <laughs> works on more than just AGI. 
Uh, the reason I stressed AGI because, um, and you don't have to have every, I mean, it's a big world with a lot of talent. So, I mean, we haven't solved the gray goo problem but yet either, by the way. So there's a lot of different stuff we're working on. But the reason I, I stress the AGI one is because even the hot shots in AGI that we've dealt with have not focused on the initial conditions. And to me, that's the juggler vein. If you, and I agree with Marcel before, it may be too difficult to solve. I understand that. But that's why we want to do a whole, bunch, a whole sequence of things to make it maybe possible. Because I don't, I don't, I would, I would agree that 90%, I would say it's impossible to manage it. But that's what we said about nuclear weapons before the management of nuclear weapons. You know, we, we didn't have World War III. So anyway, if I think that that's one area where we can actually make a difference in a few years. What are the initial conditions? We argue about it, we fight over it, do all that sort of stuff until we get the initial conditions right, including with China, including with Japan. You know, as you know, we're talking across the board. If we can get those initial conditions right, then we can talk about a UN treaty for AGI. But I don't want to talk about an AGI. If, if we get, the treaty says a bunch of nonsense, it's irrelevant. To me, the only relevant thing is managing the initial conditions. I mean, I do my strategic analysis down to that one point. But, but back to your larger point, of course, we have to work on all of these things together. And the United Nations Secretary General's office is creating a, a UN uh, futures lab. And I think we all ought to be focusing on getting that lab to work on all these things parse it out to different people and so forth, different activities, but have the UN Secretary General's office be the coordinating hub for all that sort of stuff. And when we had a testimony just uh, last month on NGOs, universities, and think tanks and corporations input into the global summit <laughs> on the future for next year, out of 50 people, I was the only futurist on the, on the, uh, on the input only. So I'm saying that the futurists and a lot of thought leaders like those here have not gotten into the conversation, and I hope you do. Otherwise, the, the summit on the future is gonna be another lovely speeches that are irrelevant. Okay, thank you very much, Jerome. Uh, we'll see what happens with our future, but we need to be, we stay active and uh, stay stay alert. Thanks everyone. Thank you.